This week, Michael Keaton returns to the big screen as Batman for the first time in 30 years. But today, we're going to take a look at his career outside of Batman. It's Rick Shue. I've got Bob Seska and Freak Base. Let's chat. Everybody, come on. Let's get down. Get down. I always have to thank Creek Bass for the music. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so good. So, guys, thanks for doing this. We are all very excited about Michael Keaton's return as Batman. I've, I've seen The Flash. I'll discuss that in the most non-spoiler fashion possible a little bit. Um, but we all were messaging one another, like we often do, about us doing an episode honoring Michael Keaton's career and our top three favorite Michael Keaton films that are non-Batman. So that's what we're here to do today. But before we do that, we're going to have some plugs at the end. But I just wanted, Bob, you were kind of filling me in on your new podcast and uh, with Mary Trump. So about yeah, Star yeah. Trek and politics, you mind kind of picking that up and just letting our audience know what's going on with you with that? Mary Trump and I are politicizing Star Trek. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> are you going to politicize Rage Against the Machine next? You are, aren't you? That's exactly right. We're spoiling everything is what we're doing. We're ruining it all. Um, no, uh, Trek politics. In fact, our first episode will drop on Wednesday. And what essentially this podcast, uh, it was devised by Mary Trump and I, and we decided that because we deal in the world of politics so much, and we also love Star Trek, why don't we combine these two things? And so what we're doing, we're not necessarily going to be talking about Democrats versus Republicans or what issue is making its way through Congress or whatever. It's more about the political and cultural allegories uh, that, that are so prominent in Star Trek and across all the series and all the different movies. There are myriad episodes that have these kinds of themes to them. And I think we can all, off the top of our heads, name quite a few of them, um, especially once you get into the next generation era. Once you get into the uh, late 80s and 90s, it becomes very prominent. And so this show is going to be sort of uh, two prongs, essentially a conversation between Mary and I doing a deep dive into the allegory of a specific Star Trek episode. And then we'll segue into a guest interview with someone, a cast member, a crew member, uh, someone, uh, famous fans of Star Trek, for example. So that's essentially the show. And so our first episode on Wednesday is just going to be basically Mary and I talking about who we are and why we love Star Trek and the, you know, the theme of the show. And then we'll segue into our interview with Terry Metalis, who's the showrunner and executive producer, writer, director of Picard season three, which is just the most phenomenal season of Star Trek that I can remember, if not just period, the most phenomenal episodes or phenomenal season. And so uh, that's what we're going to be doing on Wednesday. So it's really exciting. And Mary Trump is Mary Trump. Yes, the Mary Trump. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. The former, the former president's niece. Mm -hmm, 100%. And she's the good Trump, just to be clear <laughs> about it. Those of you who don't know Mary Trump, she's, yeah, she's one of us. She's a normal. And so, and, and one of the most prominent, you've seen her probably on MSNBC, on the Lawrence O'Donnell show. She's been on The View. She's doing, she's doing a, a, a romance novel in chapters on Substack with E. Jean Carroll and Jennifer Taub. So that's also something that she's working on separately. Uh, I'm not involved in that in particular, but uh, <laughs> we're going to be doing this Star Trek thing. And it just it came up organically on one of my shows. When I last I had Mary Trump on as a guest on my show, it just sort of at the end, we started talking about Picard season three. And we were like, you know what? We should just do a podcast where we do this. You know, plus it's an excuse to watch more Star Trek. So that's, that's right. Mm -hmm. I yeah. love it. I love hearing the origins for things like this. It's so great. Yeah. So yeah. Great. right now there is a there is a trailer up that has that origin in, in the middle of it. It's there. There's a the, I included in the trailer the conversation between Mary and I where we came up with the idea. So that's so cool. Love it. Freak, what's up, buddy? Ready. Oh man, just uh, living my life virtually anymore. That's it. That's do what I call, do. Do we call you the king of TikTok now? Uh, I know it feels like it. I mean, <laughs> I had no idea when I opened up that can of war, war. When I first went on TikTok, I was like, oh, I'll stream once a week, you know, an hour here or there. I'm literally on every single night at 10 o'clock Eastern time now, six days a week. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Yeah. And, nice. and, and it's, you know, it's, it's crazy. It's, they are so, I mean, I know 
not to go down that rabbit hole too much. I know TikTok's controversial with some people, but it's um, it's uh, the one thing they are so incredibly creator friendly. The, of all the social media platforms, it's they they really really embrace the creators and no other social media platform that I've ever been involved with. So, I mean, take that for what it is, but for as far as a musician side of things, it's, it's been pretty, pretty incredible. That's so awesome. And I saw you were, you're a big cat fan and you were doing something on TikTok that you put up on your Twitter where you're playing music to someone with cats. What was that all about? <laughs> yeah, well, tick, uh, TikTok has this thing called duets on there. And uh, so basically, if you see a video that like you connect with, it can be music, it can be a weird cat making a weird noise. And you can uh, uh, you hit this thing called duet and you can actually create your add your own music to it. So, so there was this little kitty playing a drum. <laughs> I'm like, I'm going to put a bass line to that. Yeah, and, this is and, great. And, and it kind of went viral. You know, well, so, well, yeah. have you seen this? He's got cats on Twitter. Oh, yeah. Time. Yeah. I love those. That's yeah. So amazing. That's amazing. And it's not just that. It's like other uh, like weird songs that you might see on YouTube or I'm something. Getting, like that. I'm getting ready yeah. to do a Star Trek one, Bob, and I'm going to dedicate it to you. Like with there's, oh, there's, there's, awesome. there's, there's a Star Trek uh, account that uh, that uh, it's going to be. So I'll I'll, I'll tag you in it when it when it goes live yeah so much fun i love it well, i yeah, love that yeah. you guys are doing some... go ahead no i was just saying i mean it, it's just uh, what i mean the between what you do with podcasting what bob's doing it's just like it's this virtual world we're in it's cr i mean i and i teach too and and 90 of my lessons are online too because i teach a lot of people outside of my area so um uh base lessons that is and um so i'm literally looking at a screen like 17 18 hours a day it's crazy yeah it's, right it's, it's a weird weird state of being for sure but it's a new it's a new world that sort <laughs> of started obviously during the covid sure height of the pandemic and now it's just kind of the new normal bob are you still with us I think he froze up a little bit Can oh yeah him? yeah he's froze up on my side too as well all right that, that's got to be Ten. there he goes he back there he goes i can see him moving around again yeah slow motion yeah was bob. i frozen I like or something because i'm I'm seeing. yeah you're issues. back yeah you froze yeah. up for okay. a second yeah, but you're back was it, is it yeah, just you or is it everybody it was i think it was just you but you, it was kind of funny you were moving real slowly which is not like right. your personality at all. all right. it, was, it was interesting to see. And let me say so, real quick about real quick before we get off TikTok, Bob's becoming a star on TikTok on his I, own. I know. It, like quickly. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I need yeah. to, yeah, you know what? I need to just bite the bullet and get on it. <laughs> yeah. So Bob, yeah. you didn't you didn't expect TikTok to really kind of blew up for you, didn't it? Yeah, I didn't expect that, but uh, Freak convinced me. He said, uh, you know, you should be putting those videos up on TikTok. And I was like, eh, I don't know. And then finally, I just relented and said, well, you know what, Freak Base, I, I try not to disagree with Freak Base when he's right. So, And that's all the time. So, yeah, I said, I, I, what the hell, I'll sign up for TikTok and <laughs> put some videos up there. And, man, one got... Uh, God, it's like it's over two hundred fifty thousand views at this point. It just well, kind of blew you, up. You're, you're almost up to if you you might already be, but you were last I looked, you were almost up to up to ten thousand followers. That's like like quickly. I mean, most people that takes yeah you know a lot longer than you did. So it's it's pretty pretty amazing to see it. Yeah, well, is, that, is that it. one video? It's the one video did it. The other yeah. videos not so much, but there's that one. <laughs> video yeah. that uh, was very helpful that's all that that's all it takes that's the thing about that algorithm it's the weirdest thing it's like it can just yeah. be one thing it'll blow up you know and you just don't and it, yeah and it takes on a life of its own you don't plan it nothing yeah yeah like, right. on, yeah. like on, my, on my political facebook page one time we had a few hundred followers and then i made some stupid post about uh twilight zone and the trump era or something like that and thirty thousand people shared it yeah and then, and then we had twelve thousand followers within like 72 hours <laughs> yeah that's incredible yeah. it's incredible yeah i mean really truly it was incredible yeah. well look let's uh we'll, we'll kind of come full circle here to the back at the top of the show i appreciate you guys sharing everything it's exciting so the tiktok kings bob and freak um <laughs> all right so so we've got flash coming out this week i have seen yes. it when do you guys plan on seeing this film uh, i'm friday i'm seeing it friday bob i think you're seeing it saturday, saturday right yeah yeah, saturday. yeah. Saturday. Perfect. i'm right, supposed to see I was supposed to see it again tonight, but I it got derailed. But that's okay. I was able to catch it last week. And I'll 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 just say this: I've got pretty strong opinions about it. I'm really looking forward to see it, seeing it again. But what can I? I can assure you guys, everybody watching, listening, 
Michael Keaton's performance is, I mean, it's as good as you would wish and expect it to be. He just went right back into the role, um, which was the, the catalyst for this particular episode. We were talking about the greatness that is Michael Keaton. And if we all remember going back to 1987, 88, when it was announced that he was going to play Batman, Bruce Wayne, people lost their fucking minds. Yeah. And if it was, if we had Twitter and Facebook and et cetera, back then it would have been a much bigger deal. It would have been hashtag Mr. Mom ate my Batman or whatever, who knows? But <laughs> he obviously uh, won people over really quickly. I think some of the first initial trailers did that. And then obviously when the movie came out and what's interesting is that people were talking about Johnny dangerously and Mr. Mom and things of that nature and not realizing he had just come off clean and sober which is a, an incredible performance. And so, and obviously now he's a legendary Batman and arguably one of the best, if not the best live action Batman we've ever had. But what we thought we would do is kind of in celebration of Michael Keaton's return as Batman is to talk about a few of our favorite Michael Keaton films that are non Batman, which was really challenging for me because obviously Batman 89 would be probably my number one, but it wasn't as hard as I thought it was going to be because man, what a career, right? So, yeah. Bob, yep. let's start with you. And I, and I know, and I won't say anything. I think there's one I'm pretty sure that you and I are going to overlap and share here. Yeah. Um, and, and, and going into this, I don't want to call it an assignment. What do we call this? Going into this show, right? It's preparing, theme, preparing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. What? How did you approach this? Did things just pop at, at you? Was this easy or or how did it well, work? And, and then just run run with your three. Yeah, it's a good question. It jumped off right right off the screen. I mean, immediately when you came up with the idea, I said, okay, well, it's going to be these two, and now I just need to pick a third. And there's so many uh, starting points for maybe my third place choice. I mean, there's clean and sober. There's night shift. There's all, mm. I mean, Mr. Mom. There's these, so many great Michael Keaton movies. And, and and the thing about Keaton that makes it so challenging to pick a favorite is he's got so many different flavors. He can go, he's got so much range. He can go all different directions from superheroes to comedy, to slapstick, to super duper serious, like Pacific Heights, which he did right after Batman. I think that was his movie immediately after Batman 89. And Pacific Heights is one of those movies where he plays like, what is like a almost not a serial killer, but kind of a, a psychotic stalker kind of mm -hmm. guy who just goes around ruining other people's lives, and uh, just a Batman. phenomenal movie. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> so the the movie I ended up going with for my third place choice is Birdman, and that is obviously the the movie he won the Oscar for. Uh, and deservingly so. Uh, there's so many great things, so many different layers to his character in that. Obviously, there's a lot of autobiography <laughs> in that role as well. And it also is a great kind of way to approach his return as Batman. Mm -hmm. Because it, when Birdman came out, it seemed highly unlikely that he would ever be Batman ever again. He wasn't necessarily running away from the role but it wasn't something that I'm I'm sure he was interested in returning to. So that was kind of played out in Birdman. And then there's that, the one scene that always sticks out for me in Birdman, among many of them, is that scene in Times Square where he gets locked out of the theater and he's got to run through Times Square in his underpants. Yeah. And they shot that gorilla style. I mean, they just sent him out with a camera in his underpants running through Times Square with just regular people all around. And so if I can imagine if you're in that part of Manhattan at that time, <laughs> suddenly here comes Michael Keaton naked running through the crowd with a camera. And it had to have been the thrill of a lifetime if you're a bystander and a, and a Michael Keaton fan. But I mean, so, so, much, so much possibility for disaster in that kind of scenario and that kind sure. of scene and it played out so perfectly and he owned it and he had the balls to do it in the first place, which is rare. Um, I know the, the guy who played uh, uh, Sam Weir in freaks and geeks did a whole scene in an episode of freaks and geeks where he runs through the school naked and it's like everyone's worst nightmare. And here's Michael Keaton and he has to do this in Birdman. I, I, I mean, there are a lot of great dramatic scenes in that movie, um, and I don't know why I was focused on that one, just because it's such a risk, such a, it's such a roll of the dice and, and brave filmmaking, I believe, not just from a, a, a director, writer, producer point of view, but from the point of view of an actor doing something and, and being that recognizable and legendary. 
and uh, and approaching it that way. So Birdman is my number three. Um, number two, one. yeah, number two is Beetlejuice, which uh, the we give so much credit to Jim Carrey for inventing a certain kind of, or or capitalizing on a certain kind of comedy, but Michael Keaton's portrayal of Beetlejuice. I think is is better than and I'm not I'm not hating on Jim Carrey. I love Jim Carrey. But I think Michael Keaton's portrayal of Beetlejuice when it comes to that kind of over the top slapstick kind of comedy is far more entertaining than even Jim Carrey was, especially in those mid to late 90s movies where he was really at the the peak of his comedy. And so uh, Beetlejuice is just such an outstanding movie. The scene I always think of when it comes to Beetlejuice is not only his introductory scene uh, with Alec Guinness, and, or not, not Alec Guinness, Alec Baldwin. Uh, Baldwin. Boy, that'd be weird if Alec Guinness was <laughs> <in> Beetlejuice. <laughs> yeah. Was he alive and, in 88? Yeah, I don't think so. Oh, anyway, go ahead. Maybe, maybe he was. That's a good question. Anyway, uh, but the scene where he's in the waiting room, I think it's at the, at the very end of the movie and he's trying to steal the number ticket from the witch doctor. And then the mm -hmm. witch doctor, and he's got the shrunken head guy sitting next to him on the other side. Yeah. It, it is so anarchic. It, it is just such a wonderful movie. And I can't see, and this is kind of how I judge some of these roles, whether it's Michael Keaton or some other actor. I can't imagine any other actor in that particular role as Beetlejuice. I can't, maybe bill murray at the time maybe but not really i think bill murray is uh maybe too much on the mean side i think he can play too uh nasty as a as a comedic character it's got to be michael keaton as beetlejuice and i'm i'm really excited to see what they're going to do with beetlejuice too i am too in, I guess it's in pre-production now. That's right. And with so, Tim, with, with Tim Burton back at the helm as well. Well, no, I yeah. think they're I think they're filming it right now. There's uh, I saw yeah. a shot of Winona, oh. Winona with the whole getup yeah. on. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you're right. They are yeah. filming it because she's yeah. on. Oh set. yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. I did. I she's, saw on, that. She, she's on yeah. set. And um, what's her name? I mean, she's hot right now. Scream Wednesday Adams. Oh right, uh, uh, Jen, Jenna Ortega. Yes. Yeah, yeah, she's yeah. in. She's in the film. Right, she plays one plays of her daughter. daughter. That's right. right. Yeah, yeah. I'm assuming, oh man, I can't wait for yeah. this. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. I really can't. And I will trust Michael Keaton's instincts on this too for him to return to the role because Tim Burton has been hit or miss. When he hits, he hits it out of the park. When he misses, in yeah. my opinion, it's it's rough. But I would I would think that approaching something like a sequel to Beetlejuice all these years later, especially with Michael Keaton's career on this, I don't know, guys, what is this? His third wave. I mean, he kind of, <laughs> he, you know, he disappears or is low key for a couple of years and he has this crazy magnificent hit like Birdman. It brings him right back into the right. And so, yeah. I, I'm, I, and that's where he's at now he's on the up. And so I, I can only trust this is going to be great fun. I think Elfman's great back fun. too. I'm pretty yeah. sure I read that too as well. Yeah, I would I would music. assume I would assume so. They'll probably yeah. use some of the original music as well. It's yeah. awesome. Well, it's and we often think of these movies where it's a sequel or a reboot or something like that as being well, it's easy money. You know, it's gonna all the fanboys are gonna come out and that's gonna uh, lift its box office and everything like that. But it's actually always a big risk as far as I'm I'm concerned. It's never. It's never a guaranteed thing, especially now uh, when there is a teeny tiny bit of fatigue with reboots and remakes and, and sequels and so on. Uh, but this is this has the potential to be very, very bad, but it also has the potential to be extraordinary. And so I'm kind of uh, with all of this stuff. I mean, why not be optimistic about it? So I, I'm, I'm very optimistic about Beetlejuice, too, uh, mainly because of the people involved with it. Um, but my number one Michael Keaton movie that's not a Batman movie is The Paper, mm -hmm. which came out in 1993 and is, as far as I'm concerned, uh, one of maybe the top three or four greatest journalism movies ever made. Um, if, if you've ever been in a newsroom, I mean, I'm talking about an old school newsroom with print newspaper and uh, maybe even before computers were you know, churning out uh, front pages and things like that. Uh, it's a great document of how newspaper journalism was done prior to the Internet. And so you start there and then you add this phenomenal ensemble cast where it's uh, Robert Duvall and Glenn Close and Michael Keaton and uh, the list goes uh, Marissa yeah, Torme. Uh, 
Uh, Melissa Torme is wonderful in it. Um, mm. And uh, 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 Randy Quaid is actually... He's before, great. Before he went insane, he was wonderful in that movie. Yeah, and and he and Michael Keaton mm. play off one another extraordinarily well. They like, did. you know, uh, a, a confident wave and a clipboard will get you into any building, any building in the world is just... Mm -hmm. That whole sequence where they're going to talk to the cop is is wonderful. There are so many great scenes in that movie for Michael Keaton. And there's this one scene where there's all kinds of chaos going on in, in the office. And and uh, and that's a lot of fun. And he's trying to get things done and no one can let him leave the office to go to the meeting. And it, it's just it's one of these farces that would work really well as, I think, a stage show. Uh, but the the best scene in that movie for Michael Keaton, I think, is that incredible f bomb run that he does on the phone with the editor of the fictional version of the. Because I don't live in fucking America. I live in fucking <laughs> New York. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Just little things in there too. Like, uh, can you get Dick Pallone on the from the DA's office on the phone for me? Little, very Michael Keaton little moments inside in, in between uh, f bombs. It's just, it's an amazing scene, an amazing comedic performance, and uh, again, one of the one of the top five best journalism movies, if not my favorite, competing with all the President's Men. And it's, it, it by the way, as an honorable mention, Spotlight is also a must see Michael Keaton journalism movie too. So I, go. I, I, I'm going to jump in on this because it's one of mine as well. In fact, it's my number one is the paper. And I knew, I knew you were going to yeah. say this. It is, I, I mean, you said everything so perfectly. I'm just going to echo it. The ensemble, you know, one of the things that Richard Donner was able to accomplish in the, and bear with me here in the original Superman and really, mm -hmm. really even in the sequel was the daily planet and making that a functioning business where, where people were, because it's hectic, right? And yeah. that's back when newspapers ruled the world in terms of uh, journalism anyway. And to capture that on film, to be able to get all the nuances and everybody in the background, from the details to all the extras, mm -hmm. to the person getting coffee, to Perry White having his meltdowns, to, you know, you name it, Lois Lane trying to figure out how to spell a word. It's so well crafted. And the paper does that as well, but obviously with a, you know, in a very more serious tone. But to capture like the daily life of and I've never worked in a, in a newspaper before a newspaper before, so I don't know firsthand, but I can just assume that it's just like that. Right. It has that yeah. feel and to have every single cast member contributing to the conversations and the way they're bouncing off each other. It almost feels like you're watching a play and you're watching people that are masters at their craft with amazing writing and like kind of, kind of a raw approach to filmmaking too. It almost kind of felt gorilla in a sense. It was, yeah. I don't, there was nothing polished about it. It was so, so, so good. I couldn't agree with you more. And one of the, and just to talk specifically about Keaton, the thing I love about that performance is it shows him as a journalist. It shows him as a workhorse. It shows him as someone morally torn and trying to do the right thing. And as a leader, sure, yeah. uh, as a leader and a husband and mm -hmm. a soon to be father and someone who cares about his wife and his friendships. And I mean, it, he's, He's doing a lot in that movie. Yeah, and, yeah. And, yeah. And and by the way, I just, I, I got to add that if you're a student of screenplays, it is pretty much one of the greatest screenplays ever written. It is so tight. It is so well done. The structure of it is perfect. We're talking about uh, 7 a.m. one morning to 7 a.m. the next morning. It's self-contained in that 24 hours and the changes that go on. In fact, that's the theme of the movie. Your whole life can change in 24 hours. And they incorporate right. that as being part of the news where every day you start from zero. You start from a blank page and then you have to fill it with news somehow. Or you have to you, you start each day with a blank page and you have to fill it with life and the things that happen in your life. And so there are so many great metaphors along those lines and allegories to the to the movie as well. Uh, once again, it, it, you have to say it's a Ron Howard movie. It's it is. immensely underrated. It doesn't get a whole lot of conversation. In fact, it took a long time for it to come out even on Blu-ray. Uh, much less, I don't think it's even out on 4K yet. So, uh, and I think that's partly because it's this kind of anonymous sleeper movie that once you go and see it, once you finally revisit it, it is uh, just a phenomenal piece of filmmaking. Absolutely. Ron, one of Ron Howard's best, I think. It absolutely is. It may, it may actually be my favorite Ron Howard film. It is so, yeah. so good. Glenn Close is it's also better, amazing. Better than Solo, do you think? Better? <laughs> better than Solo. He got a bum rap on that one. He stepped yeah. in and he reported the duty.
he did yeah. what he could do with that. But no, it's so good. And the whole cast is great. And yeah, you're right. Thinking about Randy Quaid before he was batshit. Those are the days. Or maybe he was just then freak and we just didn't know. Maybe he kept it on the DL. Who knows? There's a, and, and with uh, going back to uh, uh, political things, uh, there's a great line in there where it's right in the beginning of the movie and Michael Keaton's walking into the newsroom and the gossip columnist says something along the lines of, what do you got for me, Henry? And he goes, Donald Trump jumped off a building, landed right on Madonna. <laughs> oh, wow. And then that's they a, all went to it. And then they all went to Elaine's. That's so. a moment. That's a moment in time, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, my I God. Love it. Yeah. I love it. You guys ever seen Summer School? Bouncing around here a little bit. Mark. Yeah. Harman. Yeah. It's, it's a really fun, zany 80s comedy. Mark Way Harman is in that, right? Yeah. And Kirstie yeah. Alley. But there's a scene where the, there's a pregnant teenager and someone says, who's the father? She's like, well, it's either Sean Penn who's on set or David Lee Roth who's on tour. And, and every time I see that scene, I'm like, man, what a moment in 1986 that is. Um, all right. Great list. And uh, yeah, man, the paper's my number one. I'll get to my yeah. two and three. But all right, Freak Base, let's hear yours, buddy. Shoot. Well, first off, I am I was super freaked that, uh, Bob, you're going to be like, oh, man, and Scott, I don't want to be like just repeating what you just said. But all three of mine are different, actually. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah. So number three, actually, you you uh, briefly alluded to it, um, is uh, Pacific Heights. Um, I saw that, you know, it's one of those movies I have not seen probably in over 10 or 15 years, but mm -hmm. it's almost like, you know, I haven't seen, you know, The Godfather in probably 10 years either, but it's it, it sticks with you so hard. I'm not trying to compare this to The Godfather, but what I'm saying is, is that his performance in that, I just remember watching that and being so freaking creeped out by him. Like, it was obviously his first movie after Batman, as we as we spoke, and um, just the performance of him sitting in the, the, the empty apartment with the lights off and, and I think he finds like a bug on the floor and, and grabs it and like eats the bug. And just like, it's, it's almost Joker-esque in a way in terms of like, you never really, it's almost like he just wants to see the world burn. Like they don't, if mm -hmm. I remember right, they don't really talk about motive with him. He's just psychotic in terms yeah. of like him trying to put, the you know he just randomly picks out was it Melanie Griffith and Matthew Modine and just like randomly picks up picks them out and and moves upstairs and just makes their life hell and you if I remember right you don't there's no again there's no like backstory why he chose them or anything he's just like this psychotic I just want to see the word burn type of guy and uh I just remember that always that movie I, I've only seen it a couple of times, but it sticks with me so much, you know, but his perform and, and 90% of it is his performance, you know? Sure. Yeah. It's and, so, and, and sometimes it's more about that than anything, especially when we're talking about a specific actor in their career. Right. It's and like to, with one of mine, for instance, when I get to it, it's not so much, it's the better movie. It's like, he's just so good in it. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. And I think that's worth mentioning too, with him, you know, since we're talking about Keaton is, uh, how much of uh and I'm, I'm assuming it there's a little bit of this in the flash too um but how much he really takes the the the, the supporting role like he elevates with his you know i mean beetle you, you guys are going to think I, you you're going to like probably never have me on the show again but i'm going to admit something to you right now i saw beetlejuice for the first time just a few months ago on, on we had wow. a discord movie night. i know i couldn't believe it everybody thought i was crazy i'd never seen it and the main takeaway i got from that movie i was surprised how much michael keaton is not in that movie i Correct. mean yeah. he's great in the movie don't get me wrong but he's definitely almost feels like a it seems like all the marketing's around him but he's really not the star of the movie you know right, right. and yep. so it, th that supporting aspect of him is just he just transcends the screen so that's my number three uh my number two is uh jackie brown um wow yeah that was uh, on my it's on my top five it, it was on my list it's four uh, or five for me he's just so i mean just his like it's he's almost creepy in a different kind of way not in the pacific heights kind of way but it's like he's so um you know type a personality and high strong and 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 climbing that like that ladder of of success in the police department it was just it was it felt very from his other roles at least up to that point just I, I'm wondering what, how Quentin Tarantino like said, okay, 
I see you doing this type of character because it was, you know, very, very out of his wheelhouse up to that point for him to play that character. And he's such a, um, you know, he's so three dimensional. That's the other thing that's so, you know, with Keaton, too, is he's not like even that character, especially in Jackie Brown. He's like, he's not a bad guy. He's not all a good guy. He's kind of a little creepy in it, but he's also like you'd want to have him on your side at the same time. He's able to, you know, encapsulate all those elements of that character. And I'm sure that's obviously why Tarantino chose him for the role. Um, and it felt like it was, um, you guys remind me, but it felt like, you know, he was, that was still kind of off of, I mean, what, what did that probably come out in 97, 98? I'm thinking like that. Pulp yeah. Fiction, I think, came out in 93, 94. Yeah, Jackie Brown, was, was, Jackie Brown was the next film that Tarantino right. was after. And a lot of people just didn't get that. They didn't understand what mm -hmm. he was doing with that film. Not to go sure. down a rabbit hole about Tarantino, but it's a very underrated Tarantino film. Oh, and I love that movie. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and it felt like it kind of it was one of those movies that Keaton almost, it was kind of legitimized him. Not that he didn't need it at that point, but it was like, there was still all the Schumacher stuff that was happening with the Batman stuff. And it's not like he was in that, but it was still kind of like, oh, you did that kind of funny Batman move. You know, it's like he hadn't become the bat, you know, that he didn't have that class of cachet that he has today with Batman. It was still kind of like the whole Batman thing was still kind of weird. Superhero movies were still a little weird. And it was kind of like it felt like with him being in a Tarantino film, Jackie Brown it kind of raised up his stock a little bit too as well during that time in his career. That's you know? a great point because let's not forget that regardless of our own personal opinions of this film, Batman returns was a miss in a lot of ways in terms of how it was perceived by critics and fans, which is where Schumacher came in. That was the catalyst for, you know, Schumacher, like Schumacher gave birth to, to Nolan, but in a way the Batman returns gave birth to Schumacher and yeah. so we there, we can we look back on Batman Returns now. A lot of people do in a, in a way that wasn't the reality of the film at the time. So to your larger point, not only was he trying to figure out his career like in that post Batman world, but it was also one of those moments where his last Batman film, in fact, was a little bit on shaky ground. So that's a really great point. I never thought about it like that. And I think that goes back to something I, was, I had referenced or Bob had referenced earlier. Top of this conversation was the peaks and valleys of his career. Yeah. And downs. And that was maybe round two for him to come back. Right. Yeah. Because it was 97. I, I think that's right. No, yeah, it's got to be around there because I think Pulp Fiction yeah. was 93, 94. And it was, yeah. you're right. It was his next film after Pulp Fiction. That's right. So that's about right. Yeah. I and mean, that's a great choice, man. Very, very understated performance, too. Oh, he's so good in that. Yeah, he's mm -hmm. great. And then yep. so my number one is uh, and this is what I was worried that someone was going to choose. Maybe, Rick, this is one of yours. But um, the uh, another superhero movie. Spider-Man Homecoming. <laughs> oh, wow. It's yeah. my no, it's my number three. I have one left now. <laughs> uh, and uh, I'll tell you what. The, That's why and, I'm wearing and, this shirt, by the way. That's yeah, perfect. <laughs> um, the, I'll choose a scene just like Bob did for Birdman. The scene when he's driving Peter to the dance. Yes. That's oh, my scene. The, I could watch that. That's my scene. On a loop. Ah, I mean, dude. the dude. the oh, my God. I mean, that is the most terrifying villain scene almost in any superhero movie Ooh. including including heath ledger i mean just Ooh. that scene alone you know i'm not saying the whole performance but that scene right because you can just see as he's driving it all he's starting to figure it out as he's driving to the dance it's not like he had our I, like he hadn't i mean he might have suspected a little bit but he hadn't figured it out yet and you can just see the whole thing go down as he's driving and looking in the rear view mirror and um the whole deal Oh, just just dude. incredible and on the you know the as far as the rest of the movie encapsulate encapsulating the every man the whole thing they did with him kind of being anti tony stark you know he was like the every man like you know that very first scene in the movie when uh the um the you know the the people that i don't forget what they call them but the people that are like they work for the avengers basically they're coming to get all the uh the, the space tech that had gotten left and uh, how he was, you know, and they were putting the people out of work, you know, all his his crew were out of work and, and the everyman aspect. And, you know, my favorite villains, and I'm sure you guys are the same exact way, are the ones that you you get it. You like, oh, yeah, I understand why he's doing what he's doing, you know. 
and he's obviously a good guy, a good father, obviously in the movie, you know, to to uh, to the girl, and obviously the big reveal about him being the dad is just awesome too in the movie too. That that was a, that was I usually don't get fooled too much in movies, and that was a pretty good one. And um, great, but yeah, just just that whole the whole performance in that movie was just just top top notch. You know, elevated the movie to such a high level. You either live long enough. What? How does the line go? What is a uh... Harvey Dent say to Christian Bell and the Dark Knight, you either live long enough to become the no, I'm I'm, I'm butchering this thing. <laughs> what is it? You, you you're either a hero or you live long enough to become the villain. Is that yeah, what it is? Yeah, it's something like that. Yeah. That's a, yeah, that's, yeah. A, that's a great line. And uh, we just all butcher oh, I butchered it. And but it ties into that for me is how well he played a hero. Um and he does in three films now, by the way, because he's great in the flesh. There's no doubt about it. But that. Um, oh, you either die a hero or, or you live long. long you yeah, either die a hero. Or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain. That's it. Right, right, right. Thank right, you. Right, thank right, you. Right. Yeah. And that's a great line to tie into that because his vulture is phenomenal. And to that particular scene, everything's going on with his eyes and that review mirror. And even, uh -huh. when he, even that last time where he calls her gumdrop to get her out of the car. Oh, the yeah. The, the delivery of gumdrop. You could translate that to get the hell out. I'm about to kill your boyfriend. Yeah. You know, and yeah. I, I like how he turns around to Peter and he says something along the lines of, uh, does she know? Does she know who you are? Right. Something, something like that. Right, right, and, right, right. And Tom Holland's phenomenal, man. We got to give him props. for Oh, that yeah, too. yeah. Just phenomenal. Man, that's a great one. Right. Well, there's there's my there's two of mine. Uh -huh. Yeah, I love it. And, you know, I know he he's you know, we'll see him again. We'll see him again in the um, Marvel Universe. He's not done with that role. And uh, hopefully he's not done with Batman, but that's a conversation we'll have to have for another day because I can't say anything about that movie quickly. And I don't, I don't want any spoilers. I know Bob doesn't want any spoilers either because we haven't seen it yet, but um, based off of you seeing it just off the feeling you got from the movie, is this movie going to be like major hit? Like I'm not saying if it's good or bad, I'm just saying, do you feel like it, it's, is it going to connect in that kind of way? Do you think? I really don't know. I don't know how much nostalgia is going to ride on this thing for Michael Keaton's return. Yeah. I don't know. It's a really good question. You know, right now I think it's like 70 million projection for the weekend for domestically. Okay. Yeah. And that's down from like 80, 90. I really don't know. I, I, this thing could be a billion dollar film or it could do 500,000 and or five, five or 500, 500, 500 million. Sorry. Right. And, I, right. and I think, I, I don't think I'd be surprised either way. It's I also need to see it again. The one thing I will say, and I can say this without it being spoilerly, spoilerly, do not go, especially since this is a Michael Keaton show, do not go thinking that Keaton is the star. He is not. It is a flash film. Yeah. And don't expect this to be Batman three. It is not. He's not in it enough for that. If you cannot yeah. have that mindset and know that he's a supporting character and a damn good one and just enjoy the ride, then you'll love him in it. Right. That's yeah. the only advice I'll give. And I'll, I'll stop. I'll stop there. Yeah. So, um, Oh my gosh. I can't wait to discuss that film in detail with you guys though. Yeah. Once, once everybody sees it and we can talk spoilers, um, shifting gears. So you guys have already taken my list, which is, which is great. I knew the paper was going to be on there. I wasn't sure about Spider-Man free came through on Spider-Man. So I have one more and it's my number two. And this one ties into what I was saying a moment ago, where it's not necessarily the greatest movie of all time or even the greatest comedy, but his work in multiplicity. Oh is yeah. So good. Top five for me. Yeah. He, he's phenomenal. I can't, I have to put that on the list. I, I can watch him play all his brothers. And you know, I mean, the, the, the one that's a little impaired, he's, you know, all the, all the, I mean, it's just, and then the one that's sex craved, that's, that's part of his personality. There's a movie that came out several, several years ago with Robert Downey Jr. And uh, it's, it's an underrated film where all these people die and their souls kind of, take over his body and then he turns into like a preacher. And then do you guys, you know, guys what I'm, I'm talking about these souls take over Robert Downey Jr.'s body and he becomes these various characters. It's not no, a great, no. it's not a great comedy. I can't remember the name of it. It just, it just popped in my head, by the way, it's the, it, it's the same kind of thing for me with this, where it's about that actor being a top notch comedic actor with very challenging material, especially playing off yourself. And to give Ezra Miller a lot of credit, he does a really fine job in the flash with that. And I still wonder, was Keaton a consultant, some de facto consultant on that because he nails it in multiplicity and he knows it in multiplicity in the nineties when <clears throat> technology didn't lend itself to make it as easy as it is today. 
So if you just want to see Keaton at his finest in his comedic environment, which is where he started in film, if you go back to Johnny Dangerously and Mr. Mom, he is as good and as funny as anybody. I mean, he could have been a sitcom king in the 80s if he got cast in something. He has that kind of Michael J. Fox, you know, timing to him. Or he can play dramatic Pacific Heights, clean and sober, Batman, funny, heartwarming, touching, Birdman. I mean, just it's the guy is a phenomenal actor. You know, one thing I have not seen, I need to get around to watching it, is this film about the opioid opioid addiction. Crisis. Oh, yeah. Dope sick. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've I have not that. seen yeah. I haven't yeah. seen it. Is it. It's I mean, Michael Keaton's best performance, I think, ever in that. Uh, yeah. In yeah. Yeah. I would absolutely oh, it, it, recommend watching that because it's not only uh, obviously you're watching a, a bunch of great actors and a, a, one of the best miniseries of recent memory, but also it's historically accurate to an extent. So what we're talking about is the Sack Sackler family that created uh, OxyContin and the deceptive practices they use, the deceptive marketing practices they use that actually kind of either kicked off or far worse in the opioid epidemic. Um, it's just, it's so, uh, pardon the use of this term, but it's very sobering to see this, what's been happening behind the scenes with this pharmaceutical giant. And uh, yeah, and Michael Keaton not only plays a doctor who, uh, was duped by these marketing schemes, but also ends up becoming addicted himself. And so it's his struggle with the addiction to OxyContin on top of his struggle with reconciling the fact that he was actually contributing to the opioid epidemic unw unwittingly to an extent because of the Sackler families and their uh, just horrendous, horrendous dope pushing of yeah. uh, oxycontin it's amazing i got I'm, I'm all over it even, yeah. even more so now and i forgot it was a it's a series right just, yeah yeah, yeah just okay. a one-off mini series yeah got it okay perfect well guys thank you so much i can't wait oh, again you, to, to, to i can't wait again to talk about the flash with you yes. yeah really yeah. excited about that and we can dive more into keaton's uh uh career i, I i'm gonna end the show i want you guys to do a couple plugs for us if you don't mind and then I have a little surprise. I was going to play a scene that you guys probably know what it is. That we've talked about on previous podcasts. That is, I think, collectively our favorite Michael Keaton Batman scene. It's not even in my favorite Batman movie, but this scene. And Freak Base, you said this. On oh, show. I know. I know what it is. I think. Yeah. So we're, I and, think I, I and I want yeah. to. I, I want to end the show with this scene because it is <laughs> glorious. Two actors on top of their game, and yep. proof of why Michael Keaton's not only a great actor with his eyes, with everything. But also, um, what a phenomenal Bruce Wayne Batman! Is, is it so, is it Eat Floor High Fiber? Is that the one you're? Gonna <laughs> <play>? <laughs> it is Eat Floor <laughs> High Fiber. Uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's snort. It's, it's awful. Yeah, yeah. I'll make sure there's no duck in the scene either. All right, Bob, plug away, buddy. <laughs> Okay, yeah. Uh, Trek Politics with Mary Trump and me, that uh, launches tomorrow. Or not uh, tomorrow, Wednesday of this week. That'll be uh, June 14th. So watch for that at trekpolitics.com. Also at Trek Politics on Instagram, at Trek Politics on Twitter as well. Love it. Mr. Freak Base. Yeah, I mean, as, as I mentioned at the beginning of the show, you can find me literally uh, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, 10 p.m. Eastern Time, 7 p.m. Pacific on TikTok Live at Freak Bass, uh, just doing all live music, a lot of bass music. Just released a bass series on there, so if you're a bass player out there, uh, check that out too as well. And, um, and of course, FreakBass.com, that's with two E's, F-R-E-E-K-B-A-S-S, -S, for everything all Freak Bass. We just released a ton of new uh, summer merch, so check that out, some, some, some neat stuff over there. Oh, man, I can't, and I can't wait for us to... Uh all meet in per person eventually. i know it, it's coming it's coming okay you guys have to forgive me i'm slow here slow 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 everybody ignore this all right you see the screen all right i'm rick shu behalf of brian chatlin courtney cheek we're the friends from work we're going to end the show with just this glorious michael keaton scene
Listen, I'm sorry about yesterday, but I had a pretty big deal come pull through, fall through, actually. It's okay. I can kind of go home anyway. Leave my cat. <laughs> So, uh, no hard feelings. Actually, it's in my heart, I'd say. Just look at him there. <laughs> There's a big, comfy California king over in Betty. What do you say? We take up our customs. I guess I'm tired of wearing masks. Me too. Let me ask you something. Here we go. Why'd you come back? You first. See you. That's lovely. Susie and the Banshees in the background, by the way. I could say the oh, same, nice. But I came from Michelle Pfeiffer's phenomenal in this. Watch his face here, guys. Not you and Max. <laughs> no. no. Uh. Listen, Max. No. Don't give me a kid in Max. Won't sell any of these speech because it will. I'm too tired of this sanctimonious world of behind and it's always coming out on top when he should be six feet under. I'm sure you have a lot of problems with your boss, but I don't know who you think you are. This right here, phenomenal. Both of them, phenomenal. Yeah. <laughs> the kids under the mistletoe. No. Mistletoe can be deadly if you eat it. The kids can be even deadly. Watch this. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. Mm. Yeah. So Just great. Phenomenal. So great. Wow.